Okay. So I got to ask. So, it, it, sorry, I got an massive, interesting question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to work my way through, see if you guys came up with a different solution than I did. Um, again, this is under the, the, you're allowed to like look at the way I did this and tell me if you came up with a better way. Um, but it's a good exercise because it's a hard exercise, right? So Axler likes to write exercises that are, some of those exercises are quite difficult. Okay. And the one in particular that I'm thinking of here, I don't remember the number, it's the one about polynomials that I'll uh, vanish at two. So you have the, the setup for the exercises, you're in PM of L. So remember this is degree M or less polynomials. And you have a list of M of them, or M plus one of them. So you got P naught, P one, P two, P M are polynomials. And uh, are, are in P M F. And then uh, also it's the case that P J of two is equal to zero, sorry, for uh, every, every j. So every one of those polynomials vanishes at two. So I'm going to show you the proof I came up with, and then I want to know if anybody else came up with anything different. Because like, I don't, I think my argument might be a little too, it's a, it's a I think it's a cool argument. I mean, I made it up, so I'm just going to, you know, celebrate my own math here, I guess. But uh, um, I'm curious if anybody come, has a more elegant way of doing it. So I'm, I'm welcoming your contributions to this question. Does anybody, can anybody remind me what number this is? 17 from 2a. Okay, so this is 2a, 17. So the way I did this, and I didn't look at any of the various resources that exist for, for solving these things. Um, the way I did it was I made the following observation. So um, this actually might be easier if I cut down to a special case. So let me just, let's, let's cut the problem down. Um, this is not a proof because I'm just going to talk about a specific case, but the argument will be exactly the same in degree L. Let's suppose that we had, let's make this really easy. So let's suppose that we have a list of three polynomials, P naught, P1, and P2, and P3 of F, just to keep the notation simpler, right? So if P naught of two is equal to zero, and P1 of two is equal to zero, and P2 of, of two, equal to zero. One observation you can make is that all those polynomials can be divided evenly by z minus two. Remember that the fact that you evaluate a polynomial at a number and you get zero it means that's a zero of the polynomial, which means it factors, right? Really what that means is that p naught of z is equal to z minus two times some extra polynomial, p naught, I don't know, half of z. You can factor a z minus two out of p naught, right? Because there's a zero here. And you can do the same thing for this. So P one hat of two and P two of Z will be equal to Z minus two times P two hat of Z. What is the degree of everything that's left over when you do that? These were all degree two. Uh, sorry, this is what we do here. These were all degree two or less because we're up here. So just generically suppose they're all degree two. What are the degree of all these guys? Or degree one polynomials, right? So where do these polynomials live? They don't live in P2, they live in P1. So what we get is a list that looks like P not hat, P1 hat, and P2 hat that all live inside P1 of that. Why did I do that? What's the longest a list can be and be linearly independent in P1? Two, because one Z spans P1. So there's a spanning set of size two for P1. One Z spans P1. So this cannot be linearly independent. It must be linearly dependent. And that means that there exists an A1 and an A2 and an A3, all of which are not zero, at least one of which is not zero, so that that equation holds. Does that make sense? These must be linearly dependent, which means I must be able to make this equation true for some non-zero A1, A2, and A3. Now, that's not what I'm trying to show. What I'm trying to show 
is that I can find an A1 and an A2 and an A3 that make this equation true for the original P0 and P1 and P2 and P0. If only there was a way to turn this equation, which looks like a linear, almost like the linear independence equation I need, back into that one. Well, how did I get the p's and turn them into the p hat? What did I do? I took out a z minus two. So how can I put it back in again? Just multiply it back in. If you took this equation and you multiply, if you took this equation, This equation and this are the same because z minus two times p naught hat is p naught, and z minus two times p one hat is p one, and z minus two times p two hat is p two. So you can go backwards, finding the a one, a two, and a three that exist in p one, and then force it to give you the linear combination in the main space that you're working on. Right. So therefore, this cannot be a linearly independent set. It's linearly dependent. And I guess the idea here is this argument actually works in the same exact idea works in PM. You divide out by the Z minus two, you get lower degree polynomials, you have too many of them, so they must be dependent. That gives you the coefficients you use to show that the original uh, must hold in the original case. So there are, I, my suspicion is that there's a significantly, I wouldn't say easier way to do it. Uh, some of you might've tried to use a dimensionality argument. Problem is we don't know what dimension is yet. Since we don't know what dimension is, we can't use dimensionality. The only tool we have is the idea I used here, which is that a linear independent set must be less than or equal to in length to a spanning set. And there's nothing, there's, that's the only tool I've got. I have to use it in this argument somewhere. So my question is, is, it, is there another way to do this that you guys came across? I mean, you mean? Yeah, yep, in P1. So the problem is like three, three, three polynomials in P1 have to be linear dependent. Three polynomials in P2 don't have to be. So I have to somehow get myself into a situation where I have a list, like I, I, I need somewhere to get linear dependence. And the only tool I have to do it is like this list comparisons. The problem that that's what the reduction is here. The problem is this isn't about the original polynomials. It's about the, um, it's about these reduced ones. So I mean, that's the issue, right? It's like, so I, somehow I've got to get a linear independent set and the spanning set to compare where I know that one of them must be linearly dependent. And the problem that doesn't work in the original space because absolutely three polynomials can be linearly independent in P2. So what did anybody else come up with? I mean, there's probably a way to do it with a, there might be a spanning argument, but the problem is we don't know about basis. We don't know about dimension. This, this type of problem is way easier once we get the idea of dimension. Anybody else do it? Are you brave enough to tell me how you did it? Yep. Well, I mean, I guess it's probably wrong then. So, I don't know. I am not saying this is the only way to do this. I'm not. I, I'm actually, I'm interested in having a conversation about how people approach this question because this is a very hard question. I don't know if you noticed it was very hard, but this is a hard question. Of course, if you went to linearalgebras.net or whatever and looked at that guy's solution, I'm sure I'll, I'll just see that show up on a bunch of exercises, but nobody would do that. It uh, you mean adding a bunch of stuff together to give me a non-zero linear combination that produces zero or something? Um, or so linear dependent combination, right? You only have to show what case. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. As soon as you've got, I mean, remember the definition of linear dependence is you have to either show that one of them can be built out all of the rest of them, or that you can equivalently that you can find coefficients to, to multiply them all by that you end up with zero. So a non-trivial set of coefficients. There's no other thing. I mean, that's all you can do. You either show that one of the PJs, one of the PJ is in the span of the rest, 
that would do it because that would be exhibiting a linear, like a, a linear dependence relation. So that's one approach. And the other approach is showing that it's equivalent A1, P1, A0, P0 plus A1, P1 up to AM, PM is equal to zero has a non trivial set of coefficients that make it happen. Those are the only two ways that you can show things are really dependent now, unless. You can do one of these length of spanning set arguments. Those we got exactly three ways to do things at the moment, and that's it. Well, okay, I think I did that top version. Okay. And I basically said like let p of one equals p one, and then all the way like p of two equals p two, all the way to p of n equals p of n. And then I said you still have to like assign p of zero to something, but anything p of zero can't equal just a constant because it has to like it, it's either P of zero, like P of zero, it's just the one more element you have to sign, or one more polynomial you have to sign. So it either has to be like zero, just like the trivial solution, which then it's a linear combination of the rest. You just plug in zero for everything. So the problem or, with the so the problem with with your approach here is that by exhibiting a single example, you haven't actually showed that it holds arbitrarily, right? Because the, the much easier trivial example would be to say if you could assign a value to a polynomial, we just say let every single p, p, p i be equal to zero, right? Else? Then a list of zeros is obviously linear dependent, right? Or if you wanted to satisfy this property, just let them all be z minus two, right? P zero is z minus two, P one is z minus two, P two is z minus two. I mean, that, that, that would be another example of linearly independent polynomials, but that doesn't say that every combination must be linear, linearly dependent. I guess by like assigning the right data, that's like P of one to P of n is And through that, yeah, and then I don't know, through that, I was like, which is why I was saying it's probably one. No, I'm curious. I'm, I, so there's an approach to be done here by contradiction where you say assume it's linearly independent. Because basically, I was saying p of zero can be expressed by the rest if you assign them the way I did it. Yeah, the problem is as soon as you specify, as soon as you actually specify a, a, a presentation, you're not working arbitrarily anymore. But can't, like, as long as one of them can be expressed as the other one, doesn't that mean? It depend not as you, if you specifically chose values for p naught p one p two and p three because if you specifically chose p naught p one p two and p three that's the same as me saying well look if I put a z minus two in every slot those are clearly linearly dependent so that doesn't mean that. Well, what if you're that plus p like one through p three are linearly dependent? Well, I'll take a look at your argument. I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm curious. Like, 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 like yeah. Yep. I do many things. <laughs> but um, I kind of just said that, like, so since it's p p of n, then we know that there is at least n plus one vectors. Uh -huh. And then since we know one of them is zero, then we can subtract that to get n vectors. Okay, but it's not zero. What do you mean? When one of them is zero? The p of j of two is equal to zero. P j of two, not p j c, is equal to zero. This just says basically by saying p j of two is equal to zero, I'm saying that. P of Z must have the property that whatever P of Z is, it's of this form, Z minus two times some more polynomial crap out here. Okay. <laughs> right. So there's no zero polynomial running in here anymore okay. necessarily. We're just saying that it can be fact. I mean, this idea I used here with the factoring is one of the things you can do. So yeah, that that would that would definitely be rushing to conclusions. Yep. Did you say in line the so why they must be linearly dependent? Okay, so remember there's a theorem that says that the size of any spanning set must be greater than or equal to the size of any linearly independent list, right? That's a spanning set for P1. So the largest linearly independent list, if I can show you that this is a spanning set, then the largest linearly independent list can't be any longer than that. So this has three vectors in it. So it must be a linearly dependent list. I couldn't make that argument up here because it's possible for a set of three vectors to be linearly dependent in this space. It's not possible for a list of length three to be linearly independent down here. And we're spending time on this because this theorem is weird. It's weird to apply, right? The sort of spanning set linearly dependent list. We're trying to, we're also trying to set up the idea that once we have dimension, these arguments get so much cleaner once we get the idea of dimension and basis. Yep. So the way that you think about a dependent list of polynomials would be something like this. This is a good question. 
So suppose I just write down two, like three polynomials, right? P1 is equal to Z, P2 is equal to Z squared plus Z, and P3 is equal to um, uh, 2Z squared. Not the P naught, or is it P one? Okay. Okay. Why are those linearly dependent? Is that two z squared? That's two z squared. Yep. Uh, because P naught can be expressed as P two minus or P two two P two minus two P one. That's a linear dependence relation. Okay, and what that means is that you could write P naught plus 2P1 minus 2P2 is equal to zero. If this is true, then that's true because you can just rearrange it, right? And now you've written a linear combination that adds to zero, but with non-zero coefficients. How does each um, polynomial at like two equaling zero, how does that affect it's because it means linear. that every one of these must be written of the, at least in the, my approach to this question, since they all are equal to zero at two, they all have the form z minus two. They all, we've imposed this condition that means every one of them must have a z minus two factor. So the fact, this is actually, this will probably show up again in here. So there's this thing called the fundamental theorem of algebra that says that if, if P of A is equal to zero and P is equal to X minus A times some other polynomial Q. Like if you put, if there's a zero in a polynomial, you can always factor that out. This is, I guarantee you have been doing this for basically your entire mathematical lives since you learned algebra. This is a, a way of testing whether or not you can factor a polynomial, plugging a number in and seeing if zero comes out. And if it does, then you can do that, right? You can factor. So what this does, this condition, regardless of what else it does, is imposes this factorization on every polynomial. Yep. So did you need to factor out I did because, at least in my approach, I did because I needed to reduce this to a smaller space where I could use the fact that there were three vectors which forced it to be linearly dependent. If I could not reduce this to a smaller space, I, I, I don't have enough information. Three vectors up here could be linearly independent, but now I've made new polynomials that allow me to get these coefficients because these three polynomials live in a space where three things can't be linearly independent. Okay, and so is there an approach where you don't have to factor it? I'm positive there's an approach where you don't have to factor okay. it. I was hoping somebody could tell me what it was. Yep. I have a question. So in a space, we can have multiple linearly independent lists, right? Yes. So if I have this linear independent list, does it mean these vector can can be arranged and like can be put in a linear combinations for like an, another vector from the other linearly independent? No, list. two okay. linearly dependent lists do not have to interact with each other in a way that makes them linearly independent. In fact, that's like very rarely going to be true. If you have a linearly independent list and another linearly independent list, those don't, you don't get to take one from over here and stick it in the file. Okay. That's not, that's not, that's not legal. So the reason is, yeah, these are all, these are all good questions. This is, I mean, this, this concept here, like there's important stuff in this question. So your question was, if you had say a V1 and a V2 that are linearly independent, you have, this is what I understood you to say, W1, W2, which are also linearly independent. I understood your question to be, can you take one of these vectors and throw it in this pile and still have a linearly independent list? Is that what you were asking? No, my, my question is, can W be, be written as V? No. No, because imagine that you have this. Here's V1 and V2, yeah? Yeah. Here's W1 and W2. This linearly independent set and this linearly independent set don't interact with each other at all. It's possible to have linearly independent sets that just don't touch. Okay. Right? So linearly independent sets do not Again, all of this is going to be much easier when we have the idea of a basis, because if you have a basis, any basis can be rewritten as any other basis, but we don't know what a basis is yet. I mean, we are at a point now where we're trying to do these sophisticated arguments, but the only tool we have is this really coarse tool that says we just have to count the number of vectors. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to the, the solutions to this.
um, to, to reading through these. I think that the ideas in this question, it's very likely that we will revisit this question. And this is a classic, a version of this is a classic exam question. Not this version of it, once we have the sort of dimension, once we actually know about dimension, right? Then we can start talking about, um, uh, you know, and subspaces. I mean, another way to do it would be to prove that this thing is a subspace of dimension three. You can do that too, but we don't know what dimension is yet. So if you don't know what dimension is, can't do it that way. So we'll be coming back to this once we know about dimension. Any other questions about this one before I erase it? Okay. And I'm very interested, like I said, I'm not totally convinced that my approach to this, this I, I came up with this on the whiteboard when I was asked the question. So I haven't thought through if there's a more elegant solution. Benini seemed to think that there was a much easier way to do it. And then until he realized where we were in the book and then he couldn't come up with an answer either. So, all right, um, where were we at? We were talking about, we had just done the crank turning argument, right? The, what did we do last time? Oh, so last time we actually did a proof that uh, a, a linear, linearly independent list like of a linearly independent list in V is less than or equal to the length of a spanning set. And even if you didn't totally buy the argument, this is something that we're going to be using. Right? The idea that linearly independent lists are always, at most in length, a spanning set. Okay. Um, questions about that idea before we go on to the next thing? No. Make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover. Ah, okay. So here's an important consequence of that. This is kind of a, a funny consequence. So there's a corollary. Every subspace of a finite dimensional vector space Now that's that shouldn't be that shouldn't be shocking. If you start in a finite dimensional space and you take a smaller piece of it that you stay finite dimensional, but you know it's the sort of thing that needs to be true. Every subspace of a finite dimensional vector space is itself finite dimensional. Okay, now this argument, I'm going to assign this. This is. I'm going to assign this as reading. I want you to read this argument. And then we're going to talk about like this style of argument again in the future. And then maybe I'll put something up on the Slack channel or Canvas talking about this because this is another example of like Axler's algorithm approach. So he constructs an algorithm proof to show you this, that this, that this holds, right? He describes the process by which that you can show this must be true. And what I want you guys to do is I want everybody in here to be able to explain the machinery, and even from a special example or something, I want you to grapple with this. Don't just read it and go like, let your eyes blur when he says step J is equal to this, right? Read the argument and see if you follow the crank turning that he's describing. And if there's questions about why the steps work, I need you to I need you to come with those questions. I mean, this type of argument is, is recurrent. I don't know if you've noticed, but he likes these sort of recursive type, you know, finite induction type approaches. So read that. This will be the third example of that type of argument. And the reason that I'm leaving that to you to read 
and leaving you responsible for it. It's because I want to introduce, finally, the definition of a basis. And this is have a basis today. Okay, this is another one of these definitions that for the rest of your life, you'd be 95 years old and lying in your bed and your great grandkid comes in and says, can you tell me what a basis is? And you should be able to regurgitate this forever. So remember that we have two ideas that are not related to each other yet. We have the idea of a linearly independent list. So first, of course, when your great grandchild comes in and asks what a basis is, the first thing you have to tell them is what a linearly independent list is, which as everybody knows in here at this point is, it's a, set, it's a list V1 through Vn with the property that A1, V1 up to A and Vn equals zero has only A0, sorry, sorry, A1 equal to A2 equal to AM equal to zero has a solution. The only way to arrange these vectors in a linear combination to get zero is that all our coefficients are zero. And likewise, you'll have to tell your great grandchild what a spanning set is. So a spanning set for V, everybody in here think about what a spanning set is. Means that V, one way of writing it is, is actually equal to the set of linear combinations of A and to Vn. There's one way of writing it. Every vector in V is a linear combination of V1 through Vn. Okay. Now, having armed this toddler the knowledge that they need to understand why bases are so important, now you're going to put them together. The list with both properties. is so important. It's a special name. Depending on your background in 206, you may have had an advisor that only ever, a teacher who only ever told you a basis is a linearly independent spanning set. A basis is a linearly independent spanning set. And then you had it on an exam. And then you had to write it down 19,000 times. So definition, a basis of V is a list, is a linearly independent list that stands V. So, for example, this guy is called the standard basis. For F three, important effect. Standard basis for F3. Why standard? Because those are the easiest ones that correspond to the coefficient or the coordinate. Um, let's see, how about this guy? Now we don't have to use coordinate vectors. One, two, three, four is a basis. F2. Everything in F2 can be written as a linear combination of those guys. They are not multiples, so therefore they must be linearly independent. The linearly independent spanning set. One Z, Z squared, Z cubed up to Zm is the standard basis. PM. Okay. 
why we keep using it. Linearly independent set, also a spanning set for degree M or less polynomials. Okay, and I'm gonna do something more exotic that you've maybe seen in another class before. It also justifies, it's not something we're gonna study in here, but I think something that justifies a lot of the, the connections in higher level math and why linear algebra is so important. So here's an example that is one of my favorite. The family cosine mx sine of nx, that family of functions is a basis for a space called L2. Those are functions that are square integrable, right? This is the basis of Fourier series. Okay, the idea here is that the, the broad ideas that we're introducing have applications way beyond the scope of finite dimensional linear algebra. If you don't know what any of these ideas mean, then you, you'll be enlightened in the future. This is like the language of modern science. So really secretly, everything was linear algebra the whole time. That's, that's really what's going on. Everything is linear algebra. Okay. One of the most important structural theorems about why a basis matters. A list V1 up to Vn is a basis for V if and only if every V, every little V contained in big V can be written uniquely as V is equal to A1, V1, A2, V2, and A basis has the property so this is if and only if, so this happens in both directions. If you have a list that is a basis, so linearly independent spanning set, then this is always a unique linear combination for every V. Every V in the vector space has a unique linear combination attached to it. And if every vector has a unique linear combination, that means the original list was a basis. Okay. This is a, those of you that are anticipating the introduction of coordinates, this is what makes this work. Uh, so before we just, for like only linear independence, we just said every V in a span is unique. Every, yeah. So when we're talking about linear, linear when we're talking about linear independent independence, we say every vector in the span of V1 through Vn can be written uniquely. But now we're saying on top of that, if every vector also can be written in this form. So not just the, if the span of V1 through Vn is the whole vector space, then every vector in V can be written uniquely, right? So this is the whole point of a basis is to give us unique ways of writing vectors in the vector space. It seems slightly trivial, like, I guess because we already know that V equals a span is at all. Well, I mean, that's like, but I guess. so I, the thing about this, so you say, it's trivial in the sense that this is, this is sort of a natural place where we arrive and we glue span and linear independence together. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing is we're gluing spanning sets and linear independence together. What this is going to do is it's going to allow us to define the notion of dimension and it's going to give us a way of doing problems like the one we just did with the z minus two and it, instead of having to do these ridiculous counting arguments with the comparing the size of lists of spanning sets and linear independent sets we don't ever have to use that theorem again we can just reduce something to a basis instead right so all of that setup was to get us here because yeah the idea might be obvious but we built it from the ground right we arrived here after building a lot of machinery the basis is the reward that we get for having built linear independence and spanning sets. Okay, so how, how actually would we prove this? This is worth taking a minute to prove. It's a standard argument here. So this is an if and only if, which means I have to prove it in both directions. So first, let's assume that we have a basis and we'll show that every V can be written uniquely. Foreign direction. Assume 
V1 up to Vn in V with the basis for V. Now, go to your brain tattoo. Your brain tattoo says how basis means linearly independent and spanning set. Let V be an arbitrarily uh, an arbitrary element in V. Then as V1 to Vn spans V, see now we're using one property of the basis, but it's a spanning set. Since V1 to Vn spans V, V is equal to A1, V1 up to A N V N. That's trivial. The fact that the spanning set means I can express V as a linear combination of A1 or V1 through Vn, right? For some A1 up to An. How am I going to show it's unique? Standard move in these groups, yep. And how do we do it there? Show that, yeah, assume there's another one, right? Perfect. Yep. To show it's unique, So this is unique. Let V be equal to C1 V1 up to C N V N. Be another representation. Then subtracting, you get zero is equal to A1 minus C1 V1 up to C A1 A N. Minus C N V N. Okay, now what can we conclude from here? I took this representation and I subtracted it from that one and I arrived at this line. What can I say now? I've only used one half of what it means to be a basis. So you should suspect there's a move here because we use the spanning set, but we haven't used linear independence yet. You were stretching on my phone. Um, uh, since V1 and Vn are linearly independent, the only way to express uh, them are, is through. Um, uh, A1 minus C1 equals zero. Perfect. Equals zero. Beautiful. V1 through V2 up to Vn is linearly independent. So each Ai minus Ci must be equal to zero, which implies that Ai is equal to Ci. And so the representations were the same representation. Yeah, exactly. The same argument. Therefore, Representation is unique. When I say representation, I mean just a linear combination. Okay, now we've seen that argument a bunch of times, right? Like this idea. How do we go the other way? Uh, like, like, As V1 through Vn spans V, and this, if you want to justify that, you would write definition of basis. Okay. V1 through Vn spans V because of the definition of basis. V1 through Vn is a basis means it spans V. And also you would say up here, V1 through Vn is linear independent by the definition of basis, which gets us this state. Zero has only the representation zero V1, zero V2, zero V3, and so on. Yep. Just for like homework reasons, how is the rule or how necessary is it? The first time you learn a definition in the chapter that you learn it in when you're using it, you should justify why you know this is true. Okay. I mean, now you could say there's other ways you could have approached this question. If you say assume it's a basis and then immediately underneath it, you could say, note this means V1 through Vn is linearly independent and a spanning set for V. And then you wouldn't have to specify it in line. But you definitely want to like justify the steps that you take right after you learn the definitions. Because remember, you have to convince me and the grader that you understand why the steps you're making are justified. So if you say this, I can I, I, I can only like read what's on the page, right? So if I wrote that, I think probably they know that like that meant that this was a basis. But you guys are all clever students of mathematics who spent 15 years in math classrooms and know, well. I would need this to be linearly independent to the proof. So what I'll do is just write down that it is and hope that that's the right answer. It's certainly a thing that people do in math classes. So if you have a justification, you can do it. All right, let's go to the other direction. 
So let V be arbitrarily on the V and suppose that well, for all, suppose that for all V and V, um, V has the unique representation E is equal to A1 V1 plus AM. Every V and V can be written uniquely as A1 V1 uh, through AM VM. This is not the hard direction of this argument. What can we conclude from the fact that every V can be written like this? Clearly V is in the span of V1 through V, say N here, VN. And since that was arbitrary, then that means that all of V is equal to the span of V1 through VN, right? V was arbitrary, so clearly V is the span. How am I gonna get linear independence out of this? Yeah, so you got A, you are, I know how to write zero down. If V was the zero vector, zero can always be written as zero V1 up to zero VN, but if it's unique, then that means the only way to combine V1 through Vn to get zero is this way. And this implies that V1 up to Vn is linearly independent. And that implies that it's a basis. This is not a hard argument. Sorry, I'm people are squinting down here at the bottom. So let me put this up at the top. The idea for the last part is just to say. You can always, it's always the case that zero is equal to zero V1 up to zero V1. That's always true. But we, by assumption, this is the unique way of writing zero. By assumption of uniqueness, this is the only linear combination that gives the zero vector. And so V1 to Vn is linearly independent. Now you don't have to say by the theorem that says that if you express zero uniquely, it's linearly independent. Right? You can just say that, right? You got it. Now, if you were being completely careful with your proof, you would say since V1 to Vn is a spanning set and linearly independent, V1 to Vn is a basis. I'll try to be better about this. You want your mathematics to be written like complete sentences when you write this stuff, all right? Whole thoughts. Math should read like English when you read it. Since V1 to Vn is a spanning set and linearly appended, then V1 through Vn is a basis. Yep. Um, I don't understand, like, why do we assume zero can be written like that? Zero can always be, what's zero times V1 equal to? I think no. Yes, I understand that, but I mean, can can we not assume like zero equals to like v one minus v two or something? Like I don't that? need to do that. If I can write down zero, I can always write zero in this way, right? Yeah. Is there any other way to write zero down? What was the assumption? Suppose that each vector has a unique representation. I just wrote a representation down. Can there be another one? No, no it was unique. I assumed that everyone was the only one I could write down, right? Yeah. So if there's only one of them and I wrote it down, that's it. That's the only way to do it. So there's no other combination that can, I can make zero with because there's a single way to do it by assumption. Yep. Yeah. It's because, it, it, because we suppose that like, so really what we'd say here is, suppose that for all B and B, B has this unique representation, right? But if every single V, I mean, really what we've done here is this. For all V, V is in the span of these vectors, right? For all V and V. For all V and V, V is in the span 
of V1 to Vn. And what that means is that V is a subset of the span of V1 to Vn, right? Every vector in V can be written as something in this span, but the span of these vectors also must live inside V because it's a span as a subspace. So you get this double subset inclusion, which is where the equality comes from. That makes sense? Okay, anything else? Okay. So about that. Okay, now there's a big okay, so okay, we got the idea of a basis. We have all this crap with linear dependence in the past. So here's the question. Based on the knowledge that we have right now, I'm not going to prove anything else today, but I want you guys to tell me how you think somebody earlier who was on this side of the room asked me if you could always turn something into a basis before we even knew what a basis was. Now we know what a basis is. So my question is. Given some spanning set for a vector space, right? You come to me with a vector space and this enormous pile of vectors that's linearly dependent, but it's a spanning set. How are we going to prove that that spanning set can be turned into a basis? Because that's what that's the next thing we're going to do. You give me this mountain of linearly dependent vectors, and I want to be able to say I can get rid of enough of those so that a basis falls out when I finish. Where, how am I going to do that? Yeah. I'm going to look at my linearly dependent set. I'm going to kick out a linear dependent vector. I'll have a smaller list with the same span. And I just repeatedly cut linear dependent vectors out until what's left is linearly independent. And since the span didn't change, we can start with a spanning set that's linearly dependent and just boot vectors out of it until it's linearly independent. And then it will still be a spanning set. So any the basis can be made from any spanning set. That's like big idea here. You can ever write down a spanning set. You can always get the structural thing from the basis, right? So you guys did a lot of this. Um, there, like this happened over and over again in the matrix, you know, the matrix analysis or 206 version of this class where you, again, I think last time I pointed out, you went through this formal idea where you took a matrix and row reduced it and found zero columns and then threw those columns out of the pile. And then you were told, oh, that's a basis, right? But you probably didn't think about, I mean, maybe you did. But most of the time, the way this is taught is algorithmically, not thinking about what it is that you're doing. The process of what you did when you row reduced the matrix and got columns of zeros was identifying which of the linear dependent vectors you can kick out using the linear dependent vector. So we're working sort of at a more abstract level, but in the background, that's literally all we're doing is basically finding zero columns and then booting them out. So that's what we're gonna talk about next time is we're gonna talk about changing spanning lists into basis. And then we're going to talk about the idea, once we have basis, we can de define the notion of dimension. And the big theorem there is that every basis has the same length for a vector space. That's going to be where we get the notion of dimension. Every basis for a vector space has to be the same length as any other basis for the same set. All right. See you guys next time. I'll remember, your homework isn't really due until it's in my box before I get to school tomorrow. So. Never. I do I, your homework one I'm giving back tomorrow because the grader gave it back to, today, but I want to review it before I give it back to you because I want to I want to talk about like the what the revision process for that's going to look like. Sure. Yeah, about, about the entire lecture, right? the last one because I haven't done the whole.